Hi, women of welcome. How you doing? How's everybody doing? How's your morning? I feel like today is a new day, right? It's nine o'clock here, mountain time. And it's actually a whole lot warmer than when I talked to you last week, week with Vivian. And so today I'm going to be talking with Pastor Sharon Miller. Some of you know her. I think she mostly lives on Twitter, which is where I don't love to be, but she is over there. So she's going to join us here in a minute. There she is. Hi, good morning, friend. Hi. I was just telling our ladies. So last week I talked to Vivian, my, my boonie, about her uh. trip. And Vivian just went with us on this trip, this most recent trip to the border. And so I was yes. just telling everyone what we're doing this morning. We're going to have just a quick chat because Sharon went with us most recently this fall to the border and it was her first time. And so just like we had a quick chat with Vivian, we're going to have a quick chat with Sharon and ask her a few questions that we asked Viv. So friends, how was your morning? <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. So Did you get through school drop off and all the things. Man, we are still daylight savings is kind of kicking our tails. Yeah, right. You and you and every other mom. <laughs> yeah, my one of my kids was he's been having nightmares lately, and he came in to our room in the middle of the night, and then this morning it was like thirty minutes before school was starting, and he was still in my bed, like. <laughs> Like, could not get out of bed. So, yeah, just dragging. Totally. My my daughter woke up, and she, you know, it was like 15 minutes before we had to leave, and she's just beside herself. She didn't get enough sleep. I'm like, since when have you ever cared about sleep? Oh, wait, daylight yep. savings time. Yeah, yeah, oh. that's where we're at. Yes. So, all of you other moms out there who are sipping your coffee this morning, just have a seat. Now, I'm sipping. I have a giant mug. <laughs> I'm drinking a protein shake. I mean, I feel like it's the one thing I'm going to do today that's maybe healthy. So, yeah. yes. Okay. So we're going to talk, we're going to ask three questions. And um, first of all, you had never been to the Southern border, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So why, when, when I invited you, why did you say yes to going in the first place then? Um, this is going to sound like a really pat answer but because i'm a christian <laughs> she's a pastor so yeah as you can say that right yeah i mean i i've been hearing you know for years just about the humanitarian crisis at our border and that is not a far away crisis and so i have been wanting the opportunity to go and see you know what is going on firsthand so that i could know how can we as the church you know, care for people in, in need. And so I was really grateful for the opportunity to go. So what was the biggest surprise or the biggest takeaway, something that has not left you since? Mm -hmm. Yeah, two things. One was not at all, at all what I was expecting. Um, so one of the things we did while we were there, as you remember, uh, is we met with Border Patrol. And before I even got down there, I, I think I'd shared on Instagram that I was going to the border. And someone had reached out to me who works for Border Patrol, like in the offices, you know, they're not like at the border. And she would reached out and she'd said, you know, their the mental health among Border Patrol is like deteriorating. Um, rates of suicide are up. And, and she said, I'm not really sure why. And so she said, you know, if you can find out basically <laughs> while you're there. And so I kind of had that in the back of my mind when we met with Border Patrol. And it was such a fascinating meeting that we had with them because they, sh they shared, you know, about their experience and what they do. But then it was, I mean, had you seen our experience with them? Was that normal or was that like unusual? Like, cause they got really emotional and. I think it depends on the group because yeah. I think they can, you know, when we go on these trips, just for those who haven't been on the trip and those maybe who have is those are, those are PR representatives mm -hmm. from yeah. the border patrol, mm -hmm. um, and so they're used to answering a lot of the questions. They're used to um, t 
telling hard stories to kind of share their reality. I think, I think what most people don't remember is that they are human beings. And so yeah. when, you, when you feel like a group cares about you or cares about more than just keeping people out, mm -hmm. um, you can tend to, you will get different answers from them because they're human. Yeah. And that's probably what you experienced was our group yeah. was full of women who were, had concern for them, not just concern for keeping people out. Yeah. And it was, it was fascinating how they, they shared how like a lot of the work that they're doing right now is not what they were trained to do. Or how to do, yeah. Yeah. And that they, they were like 15 years ago was like a very different situation, but because the, like the channels for entering into the United States have been so constricted that there's sort of this like overflow of really vulnerable people who are desperate and that it didn't used to be, there used to be a lot more channels for, for folks like that to come through. And so they're dealing with children, you know, they're, they're saying how, you know, we were trained to keep like single men in detention for like 48 hours, not to heat up ramen noodles for babies, you know, for toddlers for days, you know, like it, it's like a completely different, just talking about finding children in the middle of nowhere, you know, the trauma of that. And so it was really, it was interesting to see wherever you're coming to this discussion from, whether or not you really have a heart for refugees or you have, you know, a big heart for, you know, our nation and, and for those who, who serve, you know, in, in different capacities, that the system as it stands currently is not working for anyone. Like it's not working for anyone. And that the people on the front line, so to speak, are also paying like a really high cost for our, our current system. And so that was really, that was really eye opening, I would say. So that was one thing that I've, I've taken. And then the other thing that really stuck with me is how I think there's, there's kind of an assumption with people who are coming across the border that they are simply seeking a better life, you know, and that's, that's, you know, they don't like where they are. And so they're just seeking a better life. And that's not really a oh. full and accurate description of what is happening. You know, I, I'm so grateful that scripture gives us these categories, you know, it's, it's much more akin to Moses's mother you know, putting him in a basket and sending him, you know, down a river, which, you know, you, if you, you could easily look at Moses's mother and say, what a terrible mother, you know, what a terrible mother. She put her child in a basket on the river. Like that, you could easily that? say that, you could easily say that, or you could say, no, what a courageous, sacrificial mother, <laughs> you know, like saving her son. Yeah. And, you know, and another similar category is Mary and Joseph, you know, fleeing because of Herod, you know, wanting to kill all of these boys to save Jesus. And so that was really eye opening to you just to see that that this is what is happening at the border is it's um, Moses and his mother situations. It's Mary and Joseph situations where they're not seeking a better life. They're trying to save the lives of their children. And that, that was really helpful just to see that up close and firsthand. So the first thing you answered was one thing that we hear a lot. And, and that is something that we try and communicate about the dysfunction of the system right now. And that is, is that we're meeting a humanitarian crisis with a security and military response. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and imagine if that were happening in Ukraine right now with the surrounding uh, countries. Uh -huh. yeah. Imagine, now again, we will always say at Women of Welcome, we absolutely believe in safe and secure borders. We uh -huh. believe and advocate for um, thorough vetting of those. We need to know who is coming in and out of the country. Like that's a non-negotiable, just that has uh -huh. to happen for the safety of American citizens. What has happened, though, is in that effort, we have not balanced that well with the humanity and the, the flood of trauma and crisis that is coming um, and seeking safety at our border. Uh -huh. And so uh, we're, 
it's a mismatched response that's not yeah. working for anybody. And then also, uh, the second thing that you said was just how not everybody, not everybody that's coming to the U.S. should be in the U.S. Not everybody who's coming to the U.S. has a valid asylum claim. Not every person has great intentions. But what we do know is that the vast majority of them are coming to the border and seeking asylum, which means, and this kind of gets lost in the narration is, um, and the headlines is, is that they are, if when you seek asylum, you are submitting yourself to the full vetting of the U.S. government. And that's, that's five different branches of the U.S. government. So um, to have someone show up and say, vet my story, uh, hear me out, and to just have a, a need to be heard and us not addressing that well, um, that that's sorrowful and that's and that's awful. But when we look back at some of these biblical things, I mean, I'm just reminded of some of the Bible studies that we've just recently put out. And we have Bold and Brave, which is the story of Exodus 1 and 2, which is mm -hmm. a free Bible study we have. And it's talking about this very thing you just talked about. And then we just released this spring, Far From Home, which mm -hmm. talks about migration patterns and why people are coming and what that means and relating that to stories in the Bible. Mary and Joseph was one of them. Mm -hmm. And so when I think when we get back to really the storytelling of our faith, mm -hmm. we start to see some of these similarities and we think, can't we do better? Yeah. 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 I was just listening to a sermon uh, from John Tyson yesterday and he was talking about the parable of the Good Samaritan. And he was talking about how a big takeaway from that parable is the importance of not um, reframing someone's situation in a way that we are no longer responsible for showing mercy to them. And I think that our situation, our, our politics, our partisan politics have become so polarized that it's become difficult to even like engage this conversation without feeling like we're straying into partisan territory. Mm -hmm. And I personally, and this is another reason why I went to the border, I personally believe that that is a scheme of the enemy to take a human being who's made in the image of God and to label them as a partisan issue, what a great way to keep us from caring people that we have been called to care for. And I really, I believe too, as like ministers of reconciliation, as ministers of the gospel, but especially me as a pastor, like far be it for me from the devil taking me out from doing that work because I've cowed to these forces. And so I think it's really, really important for Christians. And, and this is not just true of refugees. It's not just true of the border. I think any issue right now that we've said, this is a partisan political issue. And Jesus says, no, this is not. You mm -hmm. have drawn red tape around something that I have identified is your actual calling in the world. We have to really stand firm. And it takes so much courage right now to do that. But I, I really believe like as, as, we're just polarizing out so far that that is such an important calling for Christians right now. We're about to get Pastor Sharon to give us a sermon <laughs> here this morning, which I'm not going to mind one iota. So, um, so because everybody is so polarized and because it's hard to meet in the middle, um, you know, there's a lot of women who are in our Women of Welcome community. There's a lot of women in the church who will say, I have compassion for this, uh -huh. but my family is incredibly hostile to this. Uh, my, my pastor, my church isn't discipling me uh -huh. um, from a biblical perspective on this issue. And so I'm kind of left to cable news and like social media, and uh -huh. it's hard to figure out how to meet in the middle. Uh -huh. um, and I think that's where we have to start is we have to say, all right, I want to pull it out, try and detangle it from uh -huh. the partisan narratives, which can be very complicated. And it's honestly, it's why Women of Welcome exists. We're a nonpartisan community helping attach confidence uh -huh. to your compassion in these spaces. But what would you say, what would be your encouragement to those who are kind of on the outside looking uh -huh. in on yeah. this particular issue? Um. 
I think that describes so many families right now. I think so many families are divided and so many friendships have ended even. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. And, and that again, like the devil steal, kills and destroys. If you're seeing division, if you're seeing destruction of relationships in churches, families and friends, that is what the devil wants. You know, that's what, why he is seeding this division into our culture. Um, and so I just see like the devil's handiwork, like all over that first and foremost. And I think our, our primary response to that is going to have to be prayer, you know, to be praying for people, you know, that we disagree with praying, you know, that God would not only open their eyes, but also keep us humble, like keep our hearts pure that, that we don't get to stand, you know, because maybe your eyes have been open to something you don't get to stand over people, <laughs> you know, in judgment. Yeah. You have to be really guarded against that. But I, I think to praying specifically, I, you mentioned Ukraine and another like comparable situation that we talked about when we we're at the border was Afghanistan. And my prayer is seeing the compassion. I mean, I was amazed at how the, the bipartisan decision to cut off taking Russian oil, even though it will cost us at the gas pump and how united Americans were and willing to do that. I mean, that was amazing. That was a miracle. Like, I don't think we're talking about the fact like, that was a wait, miracle what? Yeah. of unity. And I see the potential for the softening of hearts there. And so I'm just praying that God could use that to open that door wider to help us to see that whatever border we're talking about, whatever country we're talking about, if there is a humanitarian crisis, that we are called to show compassion to them. And, and I love that distinction you made between the compassion versus like the security response. Um, so that's, that is my like very specific prayer for, you know, what we're seeing with Ukraine and Afghanistan and the open heartedness there that, that maybe God could use that to open hearts elsewhere. Yeah. When you think about the difference between, I mean, it wasn't too long ago that we had Haitians migrating up to the border and we, all mm -hmm. the news headlines were showing Haitians that were coming up and they were devastated by an earthquake and mm -hmm. an assassination of their leadership. And mm -hmm. then you have Central Americans coming up who are fleeing from violence and from lack of opportunity. And then you, you know, the Afghanistan situation and the Ukrainian situation. And a lot of people are like starting to see kind of the disparity of how people are entering in and what kind of compassion mm -hmm. level that they have for each of these kind of populations and people mm -hmm. groups. Mm -hmm. And what I would, I guess my encouragement as we continue to see this, I mean, we have more people, more displaced people migrating around the world today than ever before. And when we start to see this, these huge migration patterns and things happen, one of the things I would love for us to all think about is how are these people, how is this situation being framed? Mm -hmm. What context are you given? Mm -hmm. Because when we think about Central America and we think about Haitians that are coming up, there's a lack of opportunity. There's a lack of stability and safety. And yet, we talk about, and the media talks about security issues and them kind of framing them as takers. Uh -huh. from uh -huh. Whereas over in Afghanistan, if you think about it, you know, it wasn't too long ago, about a year and a half ago, the previous administration had put an entire ban on travel from Muslim countries. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden now we're very interested in wanting Afghan refugees to come here. Uh -huh. But if you think about the way the Afghans were shaped in the media, they uh -huh. were framed as allies. So many of us had husbands and family members who were in close proximity uh -huh. with those yeah. families in Afghanistan where they were like, oh, no, that guy saved my life. He needs to get his whole entire uh -huh. family here. And we saw the lengths to, that people went to, former military that went to, to like travel over there and like rescue people. Uh -huh. at, at the cost of their own life and their own family's yeah. uh, stability as well. And then when you think about Ukraine, it's like, 
oh my goodness, they're being attacked, they're being invaded. This is, you know, unprovoked. And so when you think about how the media frames yeah. each of these vulnerable people groups, all of them are looking for the same thing. They're mm -hmm. looking for safety, they're looking for security in that, and they're looking for a place to call home mm -hmm. because their home is no longer viable mm -hmm. for them. Right. So I think that would be just one encouragement I would have to build on top of yours is, is like when we see this, uh -huh. let's just take note. Uh -huh. how, how is the media? How is the church? Yeah. How is either party? Yeah. And I think the, the irony, like anytime I hear people say the media, um, I'm always kind of curious, like which media, <laughs> you which know, are you talking about? Um, yeah. because people will say, I'm, I'm not being shaped by the media, but then it's like, okay, but I think you're actually being just shaped by this other media over here. Yeah. And again, I, I think that is honest to goodness true of wherever you fall on the political spectrum. And so I think for all Christians, the invitation here is to make sure that our categories and especially our language, like how we are talking about people is theologically and biblically informed. And so we're not describing people in, in terms that are kind of taker terms or, you know, they're um, parasitic in some way or talking about them in ways that are basically like yeah. less than the image of God. You right. know, make sure the language that you're using is the language that God has given us to use about his people. And that language will shape us. It's, it's, it's really important. And so... That's, that would be my addition to that as well, is don't just say it's the media that is shaping, but I'm gonna listen to this media over here. No, like your language needs to be theologically accurate. And when we fail to use theologically accurate language, very often we are in sin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We are sinning in our hearts like against other people. And I will say that, like I do this all the time. Like the way I talk about people I'm not happy about, lots of times the language I'm using about them falls short of what how God has described them in scripture and I am in sin. <laughs> yeah. So I mean to me what you're saying is is our language can be uplifting or it can be dehumanizing. Right. And and when we look at what we just talked about, just kind of the disparity of how we are talking about the compassion level mm -hmm. and the compassion response we have for various people groups mm -hmm. um, and framing Central Americans and Haitians and those coming up to our southern border differently than we are mm -hmm. those who are fleeing in abroad, mm -hmm. we have to have a heart check about that mm -hmm. and to say the image of God they bear the image of God. All of them do. So what, do, why we need to ask ourselves, why is it that I talk differently about this group mm -hmm. than I would this group? Why is it that I feel, mm -hmm. and I mean, this is between you and the Lord. Why is it that I feel more compassion mm -hmm. or more tethered to this group mm -hmm. and this situation than this one? And I've heard a lot of conservative media over the last two weeks say, push back on that and they'll say well the reason why we're talking so much about this instead of what's happening in uh myanmar and what's happening in darfur and the congo stuff because those are civil wars this is a this is an invasion by a superpower i'm like they're both invasions uh -huh. wars are wars violence is violence i mean the uh -huh. fact that we have grown grown stale to the uh -huh. violence against those in central america or to the violence in those in africa I mean, a gunshot wound is the same in Africa as it is in Ukraine. Uh -huh. And yet, yeah. we have grown weary uh -huh. or have never really given the attention needed in some of these other spaces. And it's been framed as, well, these are more civilized places that this is happening. Uh -huh. And to me, that right there should be a check. Uh -huh. That's a very dehumanizing way to talk about an entire group of people uh -huh. to say, well, of course that's happening in Africa because it's not as civilized. It's not a, you know, it's a third world. So let's start saying developing nation. How about that at first? But then also just be thinking about, is there a check in your spirit about, about how you're describing your compassion level and your justification for caring about this so much and this so little? Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 Sharon, thank you for saying yes to going to the border. Thank you for becoming a friend. 
of Women of Welcome. Thank you so much for your time this morning. As well, well. I'm happy to. And for those of you who don't know Brie, I said this to Brie like 10 times. I was like, Brie, you are a boss. Like, <laughs> Brie's a boss. She is amazing. She's, you have like, you're so anointed for this work. Like you really, I was so amazed at the, um, like you're so educated on the issues. Like you know them so thoroughly, but you also were approaching it in such a like nuanced, um, careful, patient, like wherever people are coming from, like you don't have to worry that Brie or, or women of welcome, they're not there to like hammer you. Like, like it's, it's not um, kind of like what I was saying before about checking your heart. If this is something you feel strongly about still being humble about it and Brie, you are, you're passionate, but you're also humble about it as well. And so I'm really, I'm really grateful that I got to go. Thank you. I feel like we're all learning. There's always something that comes up every day and I'm like, uh, <laughs> And I'm like giving Jenny Yang a call. I'm like, okay, I think I know this, but I actually, you know, she's been doing it for like 15 years. So yeah. In any case, we're all just learning. And I'm so glad that you decided to learn along with us. Thanks for your sweet words. And um, if you're not following Sharon, she's also a very anointed, beautiful leader. And I think you mostly hang out on Twitter, right? Are you mostly on Twitter? I mean, I'm on Instagram too. I'm in yeah. both spaces. <laughs> Well, I, I loved a good Sharon retweet because she's got a lot of good things to say. So. All right. Thanks, friend. I appreciate All right. you. See ya. Bye.